I am a consultant uh, on uh, this project. And Amy, did you want to introduce yourself? I think everybody probably knows Amy. Sure. I um, I'm, have a couple different positions at the University of New Mexico. Um, most relevant was my position in the digital initiatives and scholarly communication program where I managed uh, several large repositories of digital objects and scanned a bunch of things. So that's where my um, any any um, advice I might have to share. That's where that comes from. Awesome. So we uh, sort of envisioned today as a uh, a way for you to ask the, any questions that you have about metadata. We don't have any kind of presentation set up or anything like that. This is a time for us to help you troubleshoot any questions that you have, any problems that you're encountering, anything that you um, you know would like some guidance on. I will open up the floor and um, Amy and I will take your questions. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a good day. Too. So uh, is everybody like, are you like, what's the, what's the general temperature in the room? Where, where are you on, um, on metadata creation? Have you all started working on metadata? Are you sort of at the beginning wondering about, you know, what, what all that even is? Um, tell me about, about how you're, how you're doing so far. Can, I can go. I can. Yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've got the form and kind of experimented with it, plugging the kind of stuff that I have in. Um, but a lot of what I have is really repetitive. So I kind of just did one for each of those things and to kind of figure it out. And then I was like, okay, now just uh, until I'm actually uploading stuff, I feel like pretty caught up on that. That's a, I think that's a pretty common experience when you're working on metadata, um, especially if a lot of your materials are on the same topic or they are, um, you know, from the same event or something like that. Like there's a lot of copy and paste, right? There's, and there's a lot of fields that are going to be the same. Um, and, and then, you know, a little bit tweaking in, in different, in different files, usually like the description and things like that. So that is not an uncommon experience at all. Um, and, um, I tend to do my metadata in a spreadsheet. So I just like click control D and fill in a whole column <laughs> once I have something filled in. So a pretty, pretty common experience, but that can be really frustrating. You know, if you're like, oh, this again, this again, this again. So it can be, I mean, that is something to, to keep in mind that, that you know, um, it can be, it can sometimes be tedious. This kind of um, sort of back end work when you're working on a, um, a project can be a little tedious. So you need to, you need to be prepared for that and, and be okay with that. Like, you know, take a break sometimes from it. <laughs> don't sit, don't sit and do metadata for eight hours at a time. <laughs> I've done that before. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I guess I'm going to go ahead and well, I'm going to go with my plan B, which serves the purposes of um, uh, um, asking what Esteban asked me to ask. And so I'm going to go down the list of everybody who's here. And I'm going to ask you your experiences with the, with the worksheet, if you have experience with it. Uh, and then maybe that will inspire you to, if in case you had a question or a thing that you wanted to talk about. So I'm going to go according to my list of who's on there. Um, and thank you, Jordan. Thanks for you're actually were at the top of my list coincidentally anyway. So you you preemptively uh, jumped in. So thank you for that. So uh, Nancy, what about yourself? Uh, and I think you're on mute. Actually, um... I do remember this uh, spreadsheet now. Um, and it's something that I think I'm not going to be doing data entry. Is that correct, Shane? That is probably true for yourself. Yes. Yeah, so now that you okay. it, yeah, that's but yeah. One question for the title. Um, I see that there's information in the title that you show for Theodore Roosevelt. 
that maybe could be more in the description? It seems like a long title. So that's just an example from the Library of Congress, just to help people understand um, what the fields are can be used for. So it's not meant to be prescriptive or anything. It's just meant to be helpful. And the Library of Congress are they're extremely um, what's a nice word for mm -hmm. super persnickety and um, very very thorough. <laughs> Let's so say detail oriented maybe detail oriented exactly so you know so don't expect we don't expect you know anybody to develop metadata to the level that they have but the, their examples because they're so thorough they can help you with some of the weirder fields where you're like what does this mean and you can go and look at their example and it can help you figure it out right but now is this something that you're going to see in your worksheet or no I, I mean, you know, like is, is for titles, say, is this a good title for your worksheet? The one that you show on this worksheet. So that's a title of an item that's in the Library of Congress. It's a photo right. or, or a diary page from Teddy Roosevelt's journal. It's right. just an example. Right. No, I, I understand that. But is that something that you're going to want on your metadata worksheet? that that detail well i think if you don't mind amy i don't want to just jump in I, I i think that just keep in mind a lot of the data the metadata is um yours to to create as you will because this is a community-based you know so so a lot of that is going to be um in your court but i will say whenever you are doing something like the title you want to this is going to sound not helpful to begin with but you don't want to be too specific but you don't want to be too broad you know what i'm saying so like you don't want to have if you have a bunch of photographs of your grandfather you know like i wouldn't want to just title a photo of my grandfather photo of bob whitesides because I will have 30 photographs that all have the same title. So you want to be a little bit more descriptive than that. You want to be a little bit more specific so that um, your titles are different enough that that they're not all going to be the, the same um, because that could that could cause problems when people are searching for it. Um, but you don't have to necessarily do like the Library of Congress does where it's like, three or four lines long. Um, so you're kind of looking for, and, and I know this can be really frustrating because it's kind of a trial and error thing. And it's the kind of thing where as you do them more, you'll, you'll sort of get a feeling for it. But it really is the sort of thing where you don't want it too big or too small. You know, you want it just right. Um, so, so just, just keep that in mind. It doesn't, it does not have to be this detailed and specific as the, the example that, that um, Amy gave here. She just literally just grabbed one that's already been done from okay. LOC. Um, and LOC is, is <laughs> like Amy was saying, they're, they're extremely detailed with their stuff. So, so it just has to be, the title just has to be um, specific enough so that somebody has a good grasp of what that item is when it comes up in the archive. And then the description field, you can get a lot meatier about that item in the description field. But you want okay. it, so does, does that answer your question? I know it's kind well, of a wishy-washy no, question or wishy-washy answer. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I was asking that for, uh, like at least for our, our facility. Um, uh, for searching process, uh, you know, prob yeah. for searching situations, it seems like to make it um, real specific, you're kind of not doing the, the researcher a lot of favor. Uh, uh, you know, it just seems like there's just too much information there, at least for our system. 
you know. And that's it too. You do need to keep in mind when you're doing this. I like how you're thinking about your researchers. That is something important to think about. How will the user find this? How will the user interact with this? Because um, I know, especially as a librarian, sometimes I'm like, you know, information, information, information. But 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 I have to step back and think: Is that for me or is that for them? You know, we should think about right. how it is for our user. Right. Right. And there, they, I was looking at some of the other fields and it seems like uh, you can, well, like you say in the description, you can get a lot of information on that mm -hmm. uh, in that area. Uh, and then I don't know if you're going to be using like a, a, a column for search terms or anything like that. And that's another place where you can put more information in for your researchers. So I can, I can jump in a little bit just because Nancy, you and I have talked a little bit about some of this stuff before and for clarity is one, Katie um, uh, did a training with us last year that I will be shortly making available both on the blog and I can send to you um, that kind of goes into a little bit more detail about this, but based on our conversations too and knowing kind of what you're up against there with reconciling stuff and things that a naming convention thing like this would help. It's a little bit of, you know, the stress that we've put on organization and preparation, because that does allow you, so like Katie's example, right? Then you know, oh, I've got 30 photos of Bob Whiteside. I better have a naming plan for this so that I can then do that. And that's why it's the important to do that prep and organization before you even start naming stuff so that you can make a strategy that that has that. And that's a lot of what the naming thing is, is like you kind of want to have it like, how am I going to do this so that it's Bob Whiteside and people can find that and then also find it according to maybe what he's doing, right? Bob Whiteside, or did I, I probably changed your grandfather's name, I think. Hey, you got it right, actually. Right. Totally. Okay. <laughs> no, Bob Whiteside changing a light bulb, you know, <laughs> exactly. Bob Whiteside climbing the Golden Gate Bridge and like, so that way it's different enough. So I hope that helps and I will definitely yeah. send you and anybody else who wants it, Katie's training on this uh, later, um, if you want it specifically rather than waiting for it, us to post it too. But um, yeah, I think that the that's the, it, it is, it, to me, the naming thing is about a strategy and you just sort of, you know, uh, you're, you're thinking about your researchers and really your researchers are also whoever searching through the archive and you just want that strategy to really help them with how they're going to search for things. And so that's kind of the mindset you want to go with the naming is what is it going to make sense to people looking for this? Like you reverse engineer exactly. their thought process. Yeah. So, I'm, okay, I'm going to go back to being quiet now. you were calling on people shane sorry i forgot i'm calling on people so my next person is uh oh but everything moved weirdly who is who is why is this um huh sorry hold on uh my next person is sandy Okay, uh, back to the title thing and how you were mentioning if you have more than one photo of an individual, do we need a different title for each photo or can we use the same title? I would not put the same title for each item. So, um, it's, it's, not, it's not good for a searching standpoint and I'm not sure if the system will, will allow that either on the, on the back end. I don't know. Um, um, if it will or not, but they should be different at least a little bit. Um, um, I, I have in the past when sort of backed into a corner, like I, I, I had a number of photographs of a bookmobile event, for example, and it was, you know, bookmobile 1956, you know, branch library, and then I had view one. And then on the next one, I had view two, you know, the same description and then okay. view two. Uh, and then the third was view three. You know, that that is something if I, if you absolutely cannot come up with something that's a little bit unique about that photograph, um, sometimes you could put in image one or image two or something like that, just to, just to differentiate them enough that these are actually two different images and two different files. Okay. Amy, do, you think, do you think that's about right, Amy? Has that been your experience? 
Yeah, I mean, again, it, it depends on the purpose, but I think um, for someone else, especially if the photographs are really similar, if the title is different, then the person knows it's not a duplicate, right? It's not a mistake. So it's important for that reason. And I think, um, and again, the, the purpose of this project is a little bit different than what I've worked with, but I, I know sometimes um, some archivists have said to me, like, you know, pick the best one if you've got seven photos that are really similar pick the best one and then hold the others in your physical archive you know in case someone is more interested in looking at them at some point but the, for the purposes of this project that might not be the right advice so take it or leave it as it seems to fit okay thank you and really quick, Sandy, before we go uh, to Dana, um, what have you been using the or have you been using the form? Uh, you might not. You might have missed this. This is a uh, Stevon's question is wanting to know. We want. We kind of want to know who's using it, who's not, and who's having trouble with it, if any. So have you have you been using Amy's form? Um, I have only received one photograph. Oh, OK. And okay. so I haven't really gotten the opportunity to use it much. Okay. All right. Cool. Now that's a good answer. All the answers are good. So thank you. Thanks for that. And yeah, so Dana, uh, you would be the next person. Um, I had a question. The museum were really concerned about the form that they have to sign, the permission form. I know that has nothing to do with the metadata, but I, if, if who is going to be able to have access to the archive, and were those people going to be able to download items or maybe make money from whatever they download? If that, if those items are proprietary to the museum, that was just a really big concern of theirs. So do you know that? You guys probably want me to jump on on this, um, but it is related slightly to metadata. So the brief answer, uh, and it really just, quick, yeah. It just came up in their meeting this afternoon and I told them I would ask. So. Okay, so the, 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 I'll try to be concise about this uh, because we're gonna have better answers at the meetup that's gonna be, I guess, couple of weeks from now, like the, the, the community archivist meetup, we'll, we'll have more. So, and why that's gonna be later is we're developing better versions of the forms we have and explaining those kind of things. So we're creating a tool essentially, or a form for you guys that will help to help explain a lot of those kind of things. The short answer is that, you know, uh, and I think I went into this a little bit at the last event, which is, you know, the archive isn't taking possession of anything like as far as rights or anything like that. Uh, but we do want to institute a creative common situation, which will protect as much as it can your rights in the sense of like, a, it's a copy left thing. So it's like it protects your rights without really uh, copywriting it in that sense or copyright retains with you so if you want to do have like a copyright thing and how it relates to the subject at hand today is one of the fields that we think needs to be required is going to be essentially a a field about rights or permission so that you can define whoever th actually owns the stuff can say this is what i want like it's it's belongs to this organization or this individual and you need to contact them if you're gonna do anything with it. The copy left that we adopted is rather standard thing, which is don't make money off it, don't uh, alter it in any way, and always ask permission if you're gonna use it kind of thing. It's sort of a general copy left thing. So, and we always say that being said, this is the internet. So our ability to protect things is you know, limited to the realities of the internet and, you know, copyright thing is the same situation kind of thing. So don't, don't, you know, or take that into account is kind of the thing, but we'll have stuff later to explain all that. And, and that's the importance of that other field that we will probably requ be requiring out of all the fields on that sheet. So it'll be title description or name description and this field, which 
I'm sorry, I forgot what it was called, guys. Uh, is it permissions or the 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 field where we're putting that stuff? Well, there there are two fields. There's the the rights field and the right holder field. Um, so the rights holder is the person who holds the copyright or other rights over the item, um, and the rights field. <sighs> It's so hard, those, those names are so hard. The rights field is where you would put something like, for example, in the, the, um, the example that's on the sheet, it just says public domain because that piece of writing, well, I mean, it's owned by the LOC, so that's, that means it's federal property anyway, but also it's so old that it's in the public domain. So there is no copyright over that. If it's something that your organization owns, you might, and there's a link in that, um, it embedded in the spreadsheet that links, I believe, to the Creative Commons website. Didn't you put that link in there, Amy? That that <laughs> I think it's I think it's hyperlinked. Hold on. Um, yes, it's hyperlinked so that you can you can see the Creative Commons website. And the Creative Commons website has a bunch of canned Creative Commons statements like, you know, anybody can use this for anything, or anybody can use this as long as they attribute who it came from, or you have to ask for permission. And that is your own to create. You can choose which one of those um, Creative Commons um, um, statements to use in that field. And depending on the system, those options might already be there in a drop down that you can just pick from. So you you'll want to be familiar with what those options are and which one you want to apply because the Creative Commons in particular, there's like five different ones and they all have different attributes associated with them. Like some of them say you can't like non commercial right you can't make money from it but you can produce derivative works right you could take this and put it in photoshop and make it into a different picture and then some say non commercial and no derivatives and then some say non commercial no derivatives um what's the other one katie do you remember i don't remember off the top of my head um, i'm going to open this up and drop it in the um chat yeah so so you want to you know if you're going to use the creative commons licenses you're going to want to understand what each of them means and then pick the one that that states what you're willing to have other people do with your stuff if anything oh attribution like the third one is you have to if you use something you have to say where you got it um so sometimes people want that to be required and sometimes they don't care so again you know you just know what those things mean so that if they are in a nice handy drop down you know which one to pick to attach to your item okay that helps because they were asking and they were just concerned about someone taking an image and making money off of it because it belonged to the museum so and as far as the made it you know, data, I haven't really used that a whole lot because I'm an old fashioned person. I am kind of collecting the photos and scanning and I'm writing it all down. And then I figured at some point I would just start entering that in there once I kind of have everything um, in, you know, what I've written down in my spiral. And so that's just easier for me to do it that way than to go in and enter items and then, yeah. Oh. Thanks, that's helpful feedback. And also just to, to give a little bit of nuance too, think of like what that Creative Commons thing is, Benito's projects attempt to have an umbrella to just sort of protect everyone's rights in general. So it would be up to everyone to sort of define things more clearly themselves. So, so ours is a sort of a backup plan to whatever everybody else will want as far, part of their own definition for their own contributions. So. Yeah, so let's see. Um, next person on my list. Where did my list even go? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, right. Okay, cool. And is uh, Rosalia? Howdy. Oh, in theory. Hi, everyone. Hi. Well, I realized. Um... Oh, 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 never mind. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I, you know, I, I think a little bit of my questioning comes at a later stand when it comes when all this information has sort of been uploaded to the archive and then 
we're going to have a, a station set up in our library to be able to have people come in on their own and upload photos, scan them in, do what they need, you know, I'll kind of teach them how to do that. But in that, I don't, uh, <laughs> my initial feeling is I shouldn't have them put in their meta metadata or does everyone feel confident that, you know, they would be, they could be educated enough to put in their own metadata and find out, you know, fill in the parameters if they're given enough guidelines and parameters to it or should we save putting metadata in as uh as like the librarian or whoever else is going to do it uh, thoughts comments suggestions help well that's a great question <laughs> i mean and and um again so many of these decisions are going to be community specific, specific to your community. And I think that one of the great things that Amy has done is created some really nice tools um, to, to really um, make it as user friendly as possible, because it's not always metadata is not ever <laughs> user friendly. Um, uh, and there is a learning curve for it. And um, um, I don't know if, if you all have been sent the document, um, Amy, the, the worksheet that you did where you kind of explain each of these fields and really what, what, um, what you want to think about when you're filling in the fields. Do you yeah, so the links that I put in the chat, the, the first one I think is the spreadsheet itself. Um, and then, no, wait, sorry. Um, the very first one is that um, explanation of the fields kind of in sort of normal person speak and what they mean. And then the second one is the spreadsheet. And then the third one is is a version of that explanation of the fields that you can print out. It's formatted for printing. And then the last one is a printable form for field collecting, which I think might address some of what your we're wondering about where rather than having someone especially if they're feeling any intimidation at all about the process um, you could give them that form rather than having them enter it into the system they could write as much or as little information as they want on the form and then you could enter the information into the actual archive yourself along with uploading their their photo and maybe give it a little cleanup or whatever, whatever in your judgment, you know, it needs in terms of making it fit more within the standards that the project is recommending, whatever those turn out to be. So that's one approach to that issue of having a lot of hands, right? A lot of people coming in and trying to be involved, but not necessarily feeling comfortable or experienced enough to actually submit their own stuff directly. That's one way you could approach it. And, and I think that part of part of what has has been on most of the forums is this notion that fill in as much as you can. And there are there are some things, there are some fields that we've identified that are you know, of the highest importance, right? Like the title, it, whatever that item is, it has to have a title of some kind, right? Um, and it should have a description so that we know what that actual item is showing or, or you know, if there's any transcription on it or anything like that. And then this, this whole notion of who owns it, you know, the, the rights holder um, um, notion it's it's rights holder on the form but this is really you know whoever you know who who is it that donated or added this item to the Manitos um, archive um, so there are some things that are that are very important to have in there and then some of that some of those fields are I won't say extraneous information but they are sort of um, um, added value sort of fields and um, so that is something to keep in mind when you are sort of teaching people the process. Um, the, the other thing that, that 
comes to mind when I think about doing that, like, like, should, should, you know, should you do the metadata for somebody is that that's also taking a little bit of their agency away um, because these are their items, you know, so they would probably describe them in a, especially the, the description field, they would probably describe them in a much different way than I would. And, and they should be described how they want them to be described because these are their items and not mine. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so, so there are a couple of different things to think about there. There is, there is a capacity level. Um, you know, will somebody want to sit down and fill out all of these fields? Probably not, but can they fill out at least a few of them like the most important ones? Maybe, yeah. I don't know, what do you guys think? I'm willing to be disagreed with. <laughs> um, so I'm Adrian. I haven't been on any of these, but I was in the last trainings and um, that Amy graciously did, I think two years ago. Um, hi, Amy. And um, I actually helped write the whatever, Omeka, <laughs> the, the user manual, which was not exactly user friendly, but I've thought about this question too. And it seems like guidance is the best thing to do and having that sheet that you talked about because you really don't want people to shut down. And if they bring in a lot of that stuff, you know, it could be really laborious for them to sit at a computer for hours. So it seems like it's an, there's maybe a volunteer or the librarian, if that's part of their role to help supervise, but something that's just not overwhelming for the person that's going to be entering the data. And I'll jump in a little bit too. And Rosalia, just cause I, you and I haven't had a chance to talk a little bit about how, cause I know where you're coming from this in the sense of the role that, you know, uh, we've talked about, um, for you there at the museum in the, in the sense that in some ways you're kind of going to be an echo or a backup plan to a community archivist. And so just to clarify, a community archivist, the way that we're looking at it and designing it, which as the, you know, a lot of you probably know or are thinking about is that is, is, a, is a trained facilitator trained in these things to help people who don't have the training and, and won't be receiving the training necessarily. So there's a facilitator role. And I know that yours will be different because we've talked about capacity in the library and everything like that. So, but I, I could answer those questions too. Like we can have a meeting about it to kind of nuance that for the fact that, you know, there's a lot of awareness that you're there for if people walk in or do it and a community archivist isn't available so that that's what it is. And so those answers are a lot of that as to related to what the community archivist role is. And, and that's kind of is gonna be the main role, which is like helping people who have stuff but don't have the metadata training or access to the archive directly to fill this stuff in themselves. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um, and have you just uh, out of curiosity had a chance to look or work with the uh, with the form yet and have any feedback on that? I actually just grabbed it from the chat now. So oh, good. my okay. experience is seven minutes deep here. <laughs> I got it, got it. Fantastic. So let's see. Um, uh, Patricia. Hi. You're you're the next person. Hello? Okay. I'll try, let's see, I'll try somebody else. Let's see. Oh, there you are. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't uh, do the unmute yet. That's okay. Um, cool. Yes, thanks. Um, actually, as far as the form, we're not even there yet, but in listening to you all and, and looking at the form now online, I Oh, so let me, let me see. Let me try to simplify my thoughts. As far as the Sociedad Folklorica goes and this form, I, I'm trying to figure it out because for example, what I'm doing right now with the Sociedad is taking all that they have on CDs, putting it on a passport drive 
so that myself and another individual can start deciding what is really going to go into the Manitos project. So, for example, we have Meriendas 2007, 2008, 2010, 2020. Uh, how how will we how will we comprise all of that so that we put it in this metadata form? And what is the most effective way of not leaving something important out? And that goes for all of the activities, the merienda, the baile, the officer, you know, the speeches. So I'm trying to, you know, try to figure this out as I'm attending this. As far as Loretto goes, I think it's going to be a little bit easier for the metadata because we can be more specific in that um, the year of graduation and choose like three or four people um, or stories that will go into this uh, metadata form. I don't know if that's a good contribution, but it is making my wheels turn a lot just listening to all of this and trying to figure out, oh my God, what are we going to do here? But anyway, we're still in the collection and saving and all of that kind of process, not in filling out metadata forms yet. But when the time comes, You've given me lots to think about. You're at a very natural part in the process. Um, and this is this is something that, you know, when Shane mentioned that he has a recording of me yammering on about <laughs> metadata creation from, from a while back, part of it, the, the whole first part of what I talked about was organizing what you have. That, that makes the... Um, the digital part of it flow much more smoothly and the metadata part, if you already know what you have, and that includes making an inventory of some kind. It can be very broad or it can be really specific depending on how, how detailed you wanna get about your inventory. But, but you really, you almost, especially if you have a lot of materials that you, that you want to contribute, you almost have to organize them in some fashion before you get to the point of putting them into the archive. You have to know what you have and how you want it, um, how you want it titled, how you want it described. Um, and so, so I think you're at a very natural point in that process. If you're at the point of, of really just taking a, a full grasp of what you have and then making that decisions about going forward, then what, okay, so this is what I have, what here is going to go into the Manitos um, archive, and then you can start that process of of moving um, moving things into a more metadata kind of of um, setup. Does that make sense, Katie? Thanks for that. Um, I've also thought as we have so much, especially for the folklorica, without hurting people's feelings. Not that I think this is about feelings, but um, deciphering like going through like bylaws are for every year for quite a few years, right? So that we capture the oldest members with some of the newest members. What you just said helps because we want to be inclusive, right? Of all members. Oh, absolutely. And I think this goes back to something that Amy was saying earlier depending upon how much you have, if you have dozens and dozens of photos from every single year, what you contribute to the archive is completely up to you. You can take a representative sample of that. You know, if you don't have the manpower, because you have to realize, I mean, all of this is very time consuming, right? You've probably all learned that by now, that this process is very time consuming. So do you have the time to do every single picture from every single year? Maybe you don't. Um, and so it, it's up to you if you want to do maybe a representative um, uh, small sampling of every single year. And then this is something that you can bring out in your metadata. You can say this represents a sample of the collection or, you, you know, so that so that then if people see that in the, the Manitos archive, then they're like, oh, this is only a sample. There's more. Maybe I will reach out to this organization and ask them about what else they have. 
So, so really, I mean, that's one of the things that I, that I want to stress about this. You know, we keep talking about this being um, driven by the community. It's driven by all of you. It, you know, we're not dictating how much you have to put in or how little you have to put in. It's all up to you. So if you only want to put, you know, if you make the decision, I'm going to put in six photographs from every year and, and pick those, that's up to you. Um, so, I, and I think that's something that you need to, to consider, especially if you have a whole lot of stuff. So. Well, I wrote, I wrote that down. Thanks, Katie. A representative sample that really um, hit home with me. Thanks for that comment. Yeah, and as I said, as long as you, as long as as you explain that somewhere in your, you know, probably maybe in your description, you know, and so that people know that they can come to you for more materials. Okay. I I have a question, um, Katie. How does that work if you're working on like several different categories? So I'm doing some work for the museum, some work for uh, San Luis photos, like community photos. And so if I get someone from the community gives me several photos, but then I go get some items from the museum, when you enter them in the metadata, does that have to be in order? Or can I do 10 of one category and enter another five of a different category? Or do they actually have to be in order? Because then what if another photo pops up after I've entered 20 pieces? Do you know what I'm saying? Is that, does that matter? I don't know that it would. What do you think, Amy? I don't, I don't think it would really matter as long as each item is well described. Mm -hmm. um, I you think, know, I don't... Um, so in some of the systems that I've worked in, we had the ability to create collections. And right. so you might think about, do you have enough of... A, a, a set of related items to make a collection. And again, those relationships would be up to you, right? You might have um, photos from a number of community members where you could make a collection called, you know, our towns, photos of our town or something like that and, and, and name the relationship. And then instead of having a lot of, um, unrelated items that you're entering, you can enter them, you know, under that relationship, or maybe, maybe there are multiple relationships, right? Like, mm -hmm. maybe the, some of them have the same people in them, or they're of the same family, and some of them are of the same buildings, or the same building over a period of time, or I mean, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can think about how are these things related. Now, I say that not knowing whether you know what the options are going to be in the system that the project ends up using for creating collections but certainly i think um for a large number of items uh like the previous uh, speaker was talking about um an event that happens yearly right that could definitely be a collection because you've got 50 years of photographs of the same event you know over and over um, but but there are lots of ways to think about collections and that would be a good option if if that's available. Well, I think well one of the works that they wanted me to work on was the items in the museum. And so that's photos documents uh, I know they're going to have some actual physical items, and I think they would actually I think part of. Uh, their agreement with the stem on in the very beginning was they would like to keep that archive pertaining specifically to the museum in the museum also. I mean, they're willing to share that, but also keep that in the museum. And so, I mean, I guess on our, um, on some sort of um, line item, I would just put San Luis Museum or something like that. So we know that those items belong to them or, well, they obviously have to give permission for use of those items also. But is that the best place to put that? So it kind of just does its own category at that point? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that's really what, um, what we were talking about when I was talking about the, the rights holder field. You know, mm -hmm. if, it, if that is something that belongs to the museum, that's from the museum's collection, you mm -hmm. would put the name of the museum in the rights holder field because they are the ones that have the rights to that. They have physically own right. it. 
Whereas, you know, if you are also doing this for community members, then that rights holder field might say whoever that particular community member is that has brought these materials in to be to be digitized. Right. That? Okay. okay. So doing that would probably just, that's how it would just be in its own category is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the next person on my list is Craig. Craig, um, what is your experience with the worksheet and what questions do you have today? Well, um, I have been, let me turn this water off really quick. Um, I've been designing this worksheet, right? This intake worksheet for our audio digitization lab, though it sounds like we're gonna have capacity to do other stuff as well. So really this is all just very helpful. You know, I've been emailing back and forth with Katie for a while to try and think of a time, though I think that this, uh, hearing all of this may make our meeting less uh, necessary because we're going over probably everything that we would have talked about. So I don't know if I really have any questions. Everyone else has been asking everything that I could have possibly thought of, uh, which is helpful, right? But um, yeah, this is all just kind of fascinating and, and hearing what kind of different people are troubleshooting with their particular stuff is helpful because I'm getting a lot of different kinds of things. I'm going to totally put you on the spot and say, like, because you are working with media, which I think is a little bit different than most of mostly we've, you know, really concentrated on talking with everyone else about uh, photos and stuff. Is there anything that you think just listening to all this that you've had observations about working with time based media that you think just would be useful or helpful to share? I'm totally putting you on the spot because I'm cruel. It's, it's all good. I'm used to it, Shane, at this point. How long have we known each other? A few months? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, in terms of time-based media, what I'm doing when I can, because I don't have the best Spanish, I have some. So that is kind of a place where I'm coming into all of this work at a deficit. But where I can understand well, I'm just taking notes, you know? Um, so the other day I did an interview with, or I was digitizing an interview. There was a, a woman who, who was from Chimayo, who was a nurse at Los Alamos. Um, and there was a lot about her starting to notice a lot of cancers popping up. So like that, I felt like was really important. So I put a lot of notes about that and I'm hoping to kind of have that be in the metadata and in the description, because I know that you know, that could be very useful for like people doing work around downwinder communities in the state of New Mexico and, you know, the American West in general. Um, so just stuff like that. And that is different, right, than a photograph. A photograph, you can kind of like look at it and take, you know, do it relatively quickly. Whereas my work, it has a lot to do with just sitting there and listening to these um, oral history interviews, but that has been pretty cool. And, you know, since I'm studying history, it's interesting, but yeah, I'm just taking notes and then kind of figuring out what fits in as metadata and then what fits in is what's gonna be in the description. And then, yeah, so on down the rabbit hole. So let's see, um, who have I, I'm seeing who I may have missed. Um, oh, sorry, my cat just, hold on, there, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, um, so let's see, so there's two people, uh, uh, Rosa, um, uh, I think there's a separate, there's Rosalia, which we've talked, Rosalia and Rosa. Rosa, are you there? Ouch. Um, okay, and then 
Uh, hi, John. John Valdez. Hi, hi, how are you doing? I'm not sure. I know that you were probably wanting to lurk today, but and you probably haven't seen the worksheet so far, but I know that you had a lot of experience with metadata before. And just in case you wanted to share anything, I didn't want to leave you out and not call on you. So you can you can tell me you just want to lurk if you want. But um, yeah, so what's going on? Hi. Well, thank you very much for uh, sending me the email. I'm, I'm glad to hear some familiar voices and see familiar faces, Amy and Adrian, uh, and you, of course, and uh, I don't know the rest of the group, or Sandy, I know well, and but uh, I just have been listening. Um, as I told you before, my life is a little strange with having to care for my 95-year-old mother, but so I, I haven't put a lot of time and effort into this, and I think Sandy and I need to meet. Um, but I had a question and I think Dana uh, asked it and Amy said, uh, uh, one of the questions that I had had to do with categories. And I guess I'll use that word and Amy would use the word collections uh, because one of my initial thoughts way back was the, all these uh, photos that have been posted in uh, the Families of Costilla page or Cerro or Cuesta page. Uh, I, I thought that if we're gonna allow people, viewers to search, uh, maybe we can uh, teach them to search by a category. Like for instance, uh, Esteban and I, I had done some work previously on identifying World War I soldiers from uh, Costilla and Cerro and Cuesta, actually most of Taos County. And uh, he and I just recently talked and he put a little article in the Manitos page. But I was thinking, you know, if we allow people to search by categories, soldiers, for example, or educators, or um, school, or education, or, or something, uh, and then it, with a metadata sheet, and I heard Katie say, uh, we could have uh, photos of the same person, but uh, maybe a little descriptor that would uh, identify uh, each photo differently, whether it be by year or, or some other uh, form or label. But so Shane, my question again had to do with categories is, so, so you, you know what I'm talking about, because we talked about this before. So is what uh, um, Amy said, is that what we should look at? Hello? Yeah, hi, no, I, I'm thinking, sorry. I, I was thinking sort of about it. Um, and feel free to jump in, Amy and Katie, if, if you have better thoughts on this than I have. I feel like categories, uh, there's a difference to me between, um, let's see, uh, see, I'm thinking, I'm trying to figure this out. Well, like, let, me, let me jump in real quick while you're forming your thoughts. Oh, good, good, yes. Um, I think that um, I, I think what you're talking about, what sounds like, so I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, what sounds like you're talking about the way that, that this would, the categories would be used, that's really what subject terms are for. And so, and, and you'll notice there is a field on the, in the spreadsheet for subject terms. <sighs> subject terms can get a little bit complicated uh, because so for example at, at an institution i would probably use library of congress subject headings because many many people use library of congress subject headings and then if we're all using the same subject headings if i have educators as one of my subject headings and you are also using educators as one of your subject headings, and Dana is using it as one of her subject headings, then all of the photos that have educators, educators as a subject heading are gonna come up together, clumped together. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, but the problem with that is, so that's, that's what's called controlled vocabulary, which means we all agree that we're using the same term because what if I use educators but Dana uses teachers 
Mm-hmm. You know, so so that's where the problem of controlled vocabulary comes in. And then there are a lot, a lot, a lot of problems with the Library of Congress subject headings being, um, let's see, how could we put this? Um, sometimes not politically correct, sometimes incredibly out of date, not reflective of uh, communities. Um, and so that is one of the things we've talked about, we've sort of bandied this about in the uh, Manitos project about, do we want to use those kind of subject headings? Do we want to let, do we want to create community driven subject headings, but then we have to have some kind of official, you know, effort to do that. And we all have to agree to use the same subject terms. So it's a very, very complicated issue. And, um, that's in particular, you know, when we were talking about, you know, are people going to want to fill out this this field or that field or do all of this in metadata? Subject headings in particular is one of those things that I feel if you start talking to people about controlled vocabulary subject headings, they're just going to throw up their hands and be like, no, thank you. I mean, it's part of my job as a cataloger. And sometimes I feel like throwing up my hands and saying no, thank you to it. Um, so it can be really it can be really complex, but that's that is usually how a, a, an online database um, or an online archive, that is how they create those categories for you to use, is that they're, you know, they, they use those subject headings to group things together. Is any of that making sense? Yes, Amy, it does. Amy Shane, did I, <laughs> did I get us too no, far into the weeds? No, it, it's totally <laughs> perfect, actually, because it was kind of where I was going and, and you made the uh, the word that I was trying to remember, like, which is the subject headings is perfect. So John, and, and you will remember us talking about it before you and I, so that is the thing. And, and so a, a development that you would, that will have happened recently, and maybe we haven't even talked to, talked generally about it is, uh, as we did look at say the Dublin core, right? Um, is that subject headings is not a required field. So subjects in that way and what you're calling categories are totally optional so like there's no need to have to like bend yourself into like a pretzel to to try to make that thing happen because we're not making that required it's just going to be title description and then kind of an idea of permissions which oh i was going to say earlier just quickly about that so for everybody's benefit as an aside really kind of why we're wanting that to be one of the requireds is that we know everyone's going to want to define that later, so might as well define it up front and sooner. So, but in regards to your subject about categories, so, and I think another thing of what you're talking about and why I, I, I feel like it's a valuable idea is, you know, wanting to make sure that something gets searched correctly and comes up whether or not it's in a title or something else like that. Um, and so one thing that's helpful is to tend, tend to remember that all fields, including description, will show up in the search unless somebody starts to exclude, do, do, do an advanced search. So as far as categories or even keywords, there's even a keywords field that you could use. But if you want to include categories, you can always just include it. If, if it's, it's like a thing that you want to make sure people come up and has that define that particular thing. You can always just add it as a keyword or know that as you describe something, if you include it in the description that it will search for that and find it in most searches, but you don't have to like categorize things if you don't want to. Okay. Yeah. This is pretty, put, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Amy. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I put a link in the chat to one of the digital archives that I used to work on. And um, in the, in the left-hand sidebar, you can you can see there's a list of the collections, and then below that there's a list of subjects, and so that might help to make to differentiate what those two things are. Like a subject is going to be about an individual item, right? Like what is you know who's in this photo? That's a subject. Um, what what is the nurse from Los Alamos talking about in her oral history? That's a subject. A collection is about a group, right? So. In New Mexico digital collections, we had um, groups of items from different museums around the state. And so that's maybe the clearest, th the best way for me to clarify the confusion that I created. Sorry about that. Um, but you know, going forward, 
um, NMDC is a great example because there's a really broad, there's a lot of differences about how different institutions chose to handle things. And so you can look in there and see like if someone has an image or something that's similar to the item that you have, how did they describe it? And maybe you'll like what they did and you'll want to copy it or you'll be like, that's terrible and I want to do something different. But either way, it'll help you clarify, you know, what your own thoughts and intentions are. So feel free to dig in there. There's a ton of stuff in there. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm scrolling through this. Great idea, Amy. Don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Sometimes I do that. If I'm like, what subject heading should I use? I'll just look at stuff that's similar. What are, what are they using? You know, mm -hmm. and that can that can actually be that's kind of a, a tip to use when you're using Library of Congress subject headings because you don't. It's not always intuitive. It can take a long time to find what term Library of Congress uses for a particular item. Um, it can be a little complicated because, like I said, a lot of them are very outdated and um, not culturally correct and all sorts of things. Cool. So we, we, we've talked with everybody that is on the call. Um, and so does anybody else have any new questions uh, that has popped up in the meantime? Shane? Yes. Could you email me that form, the spreadsheet? I have not looked at it. Totally. Absolutely, John. I totally will do that. So okay, I will thank you. make sure that, and yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, so I'm writing, I'm writing notes because um, I don't trust my own brain. Um, so great. So um, it's just after five now. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. This was a really great discussion. So I really appreciate all your guys' input and feedback and everything. Know that we're going to be doing another Platica in December, and it's going to be basically part two of this event, which I so encouraged by the discussion we had that I think it's going to be great and we'll have more questions. And hopefully after we at least have, well, the, 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 meetup event that we're doing as soon as the doodle poll closes will happen but between now and then so hopefully by then we will also have more information for you guys on the the archive as it will be and that will inspire some of our discussion too so i'm really looking forward to the second part of this platica and uh continuing this discussion because i feel like we're really working towards a sort of a a uh uh a a uh crowd share and group thing towards understanding some of this metadata. So thank you everybody for taking part in the discussion. Amy, Katie, do you guys have anything you wanna say before we head, head out to the evening? Nice to yeah. see everybody. It is nice to see everybody. And I, and I really appreciate y'all sharing with us, you know, how you're feeling and, and how this is going for you. And I just want you to, to I, I just wanna to reiterate to you that, that um, I think you're all doing pretty well. And, and I think that you're all encountering some of these issues that you're encountering are normal issues to encounter. These are the kind of things that you, that everybody, including, you know, people who do this for a living, you know, have to encounter when they're, when they're doing meditation. This is so, all the stuff I struggled with when I started my job at UNM. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So please and don't you, just, you, know, you learn as you go along. Yeah. Don't ever feel like you're doing something wrong. Um, I mean, it's all part of the process and it all, it, there is an enormous learning curve with this kind of stuff. 